Hey everyone, SJ Newell here. I came across this video the other day by Alan Parr. Apparently this guy is huge on YouTube. I don't know that much about him, but he's talking about speaking in tongues, which is one of the few areas I feel comfortable going into depth about, and I thought I'd do a breakdown of it. Now, I want to say up front that this is by no means a bashing video. I won't be making any ad hominems attacks. If you guys are familiar with our approach, that just isn't our MO. And we really despise it when Christians behave that way. I'll link to some of our other videos in the description if you want to know more about my take on things like heresy, false doctrine, and labeling other ministers. I'm also going to link to our FAQ on tongues from our site in case you had a question we don't address here. Let's go over the ground rules. Number one, we consider any statement within the text of the Bible to be true. We consider anything that denies or contradicts a statement in the text of the Bible to be false. We realize there are some things which do not fit either of these categories, neither being stated in the Bible nor denying or contradicting the Bible. Such statements are simply not falsifiable, meaning they're unable to be observed and thus not authoritative. Number two, we consider the Bible in pretty much all of its mainstream versions and translations, including the original languages it was written in, to be God's infallible word. This means it accurately and precisely conveys is thought via the language used therein. Number three, the goal is to make observations and as few assumptions or speculations as possible. If we do speculate or assume, we will let you know. Number four, as always, we know it's possible for us to say something that's incorrect and are counting on you, the observer, to let us know when we do. So please, don't hesitate to reach out if you catch something. What does the Bible teach about this gift of speaking in tongues? That's what we're going to talk about today on The Beat. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back. My name is Alan Parr. And so today we are tackling the ever so controversial subject of speaking in tongues. And so in this video, I want to talk about what is the gift of tongues and also what are some of the misconceptions associated with the gift? And then finally, how should this gift be properly used within a church context? OK, so we will be dealing with just the first two here. The rest I didn't really have any issue with. So what exactly is this gift of speaking in tongues? Well, the original gift was the supernatural ability for someone to be able to share the gospel in a language that they had not previously learned. So that would be like me traveling to Japan and somehow sharing my faith with people in Japan, even though Japanese is not my native language. Okay, to my knowledge, the Bible never defines the gift of tongues this way, which would put his statement in the not falsifiable category. <laughs> We're not saying it is or isn't true, but simply that it cannot be observed in the text. That being said, because many Christians believe this and much of his argument, the remainder of the video relies on this assumption, we'll go along with it, but do want to point out it is indeed an assumption. Some also believe that it is the ability to speak or pray to God in an unknown language. That's true. Some people do believe the gift of tongues is the ability to speak or pray to God in an unknown language. I'm not one of those people because the Bible never specifically defines the gift of tongues that way, just like it doesn't define it the way Alan mentioned earlier. But that doesn't necessarily mean there is no such thing as a prayer tongue, and we'll talk more about that in a second. Still talking about praying in tongues, Alan continues. However, interestingly enough, there is not one example of this type of tongue found anywhere in the Bible, and there are no records of it being used this way in the early church. Okay, so there are two separate claims being made here. Let's start with the first one. First claim. There is not one example of this type of tongue found anywhere in the Bible. We would need Mr. Parr to clarify exactly what he means by example. But if he means it is never mentioned, then his statement would be false. Here's why. 1 Corinthians 14.2 says that he that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not unto men, but unto God. For no man understands him, however, in the spirit he speaks mysteries. Later in the chapter, Paul writes, For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is the conclusion then? I will pray with the spirit, and I will pray with the understanding. I will sing with the spirit, and I will also sing with the understanding. And again here, If there is no interpreter, let him keep silent in the church, and let him speak to himself and to God. Speaking to God is, of course, prayer. So yes, unknown tongues spoken to God or praying in tongues is indeed mentioned in the Bible multiple times. Now, someone brought up this fact in the comment section of his original video, and to his credit, he clarified by saying this, quote, So essentially what I meant was that there are no examples of people speaking or praying in unknown tongues in the Bible. 
Certainly it is spoken about, but where do we see it actually being practiced? So this is essentially the second part of his claim from earlier, so let's address it now. The claim that there are no examples of people praying in unknown tongues in the Bible really can't be verified one way or the other. It's another non-falsifiable. The reason why is because in the book of Acts, other than chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, every time someone was recorded speaking in tongues, it does not specify the tongue they used, nor who they were talking to. So a more accurate statement would be that we simply do not know if there are examples of people praying to God in unknown tongues. But it's certainly possible that one of the recorded times people spoke in tongues in Acts, this is what they were doing. Now I want to add a little side note here. Observing examples of things in the Bible doesn't speak to whether or not it should be happening. That's known as an argument from silence, and it's based on the assumption that silence equates to something more than just silence. So even if we could say for sure that there were no recorded incidents of people praying in tongues in the Bible, this in itself would not mean anything other than there were no recorded incidents of people praying in tongues in the Bible. Of course, often people do believe silence means something, and they're welcome to believe that, but it's an assumption, so we should clarify it as such. Since we now know prayer tongues are mentioned in the Bible, we should note that according to Allen's original definition, they would not fall under the gift of tongues for two reasons. One, because it's a tongue that no man understands. Allen had used Acts chapter 2 in Japanese as an example where people heard the gospel in their native language. Nor are they talking to man, so they're not sharing the gospel with anyone. They're not sharing anything with anyone. They're praying to God. By the way, it wouldn't really make sense for these type of tongues to be a gift anyway, because all the gifts listed in chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians are for the profit of all. They edify others. But the Bible says of this type of tongue that it edifies the individual and not others. Instead of it being called a gift of the Spirit, it's referred to as praying in or with the Spirit. See, if we call it a gift, then it leaves the impression that some may have it and some may not. But if we call it what the Bible calls it, praying with your spirit, it's kind of an odd idea to claim that while all believers can pray with their minds, only a select few can additionally pray with their spirits. What are the misconceptions associated with the gift of tongues? Well, first of all, it's this idea that every Christian can somehow learn how to speak in tongues. The Bible teaches that speaking in tongues is a spiritual gift, which means that it is the Holy Spirit who distributes the gifts to each believer as he sees fit. So I don't know how a Christian can learn how to speak in tongues any more than they can learn how to possess the gift of healing or miracles or the gift of pastoring. Okay, if we are going with his definition given. The original gift was a supernatural ability for someone to be able to share the gospel in a language that they had not previously learned. Then yeah, obviously if you learn the language beforehand, that would not qualify. But this doesn't address praying in the spirit or give a reason for why every believer could not learn how to pray in tongues. While it's true there are no passages in the Bible that use a how-to type of terminology when it comes to speaking in tongues, this may be partially just arguing semantics, because there are many things we can learn about the topic which would directly influence how we practice it, resulting in, effectively, Christians being able to learn how to do it. Scriptures tell us, for example, that we should not forbid speaking in tongues. So from this passage alone, we could explore things that may lead us to knowingly or unknowingly refuse the practice, such as the fear of an inauthentic experience. Sometimes Christians are afraid they will act out insincerely or fake the experience. So we could ask, has such a fear led us to quench the spirit and avoid doing it or even attempting to do it altogether? Then of course there are more general passages whose application do not exclude the topic of tongues. For example, in Proverbs it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean to your own understanding. Is tongues an area that we should not apply this instruction from Proverbs? Of course not we should still trust in the Lord and not lean to our own understandings. Remember, Paul mentioned that when you pray in tongues, the understanding is going to be unproductive. That's important to keep in mind because sometimes your understanding will come up with all kinds of unbiblical expectations about what it's supposed to feel like or sound like to speak in tongues. For instance, some understand tongues to be a force that takes control of you and somehow makes you do it. Others understand it to be accompanied by some kind of spiritual euphoria. While speaking in tongues may happen in these sorts of ways, the Bible never says it has to happen this way. So we should not lean on our own understandings here. Instead, we should trust God like Proverbs instructs us to do, knowing that the understanding will be unproductive. I just hit on a handful of scriptures that teach us valuable insights that can be applied to speaking in tongues. There are plenty more. Could you call that a how-to? I think so. But like I said, the actual terminology isn't there, so we can't be dogmatic about saying it that way. 
Another misconception is that people who speak in tongues somehow possess more spiritual power than those that don't. Well, it depends on how you define spiritual power. 1 Corinthians 14, 4 says the person who speaks in tongues edifies himself. And if you do a study on the word edify, checking different lexicons and translations, you'll find some fascinating ramifications for speaking in tongues. Amplified, for example, says about the word that it improves and promotes growth in Christian wisdom, piety, holiness, and happiness. New Living Translation uses the word strengthen. I don't know about you, but I'd say all of those things equate to more spiritual power. But it's possible Alan had something else in mind, so we would really have to leave this open for him to clarify. The problem with this view is that I don't see anywhere in scripture where people who speak in tongues are able to accomplish more than those that don't. He uses some interesting terminology here, so I'm not quite sure this contradicts what he said, but I still think it deserves to be noted. The 12 12 apostles plus Paul all spoke in tongues. In Acts chapter 2, the Bible says they were there in the upper room and did it, and of course we know Paul did it from his statements in 1 Corinthians. You'd be hard pressed to find men who accomplished more for the furtherance of the gospel than these guys. The problem with this mentality is that it further divides the church more than it already is because it separates the church into the haves and the have nots, and it can oftentimes make people who do not have the spiritual gift of tongues feel inferior to those that do. I don't know if this really is a problem. For one thing, as we mentioned before, praying in tongues is never referred to specifically as the gift of tongues. So it isn't a haves versus the have-nots, it would be the do's versus the do-nots. You could say the same thing about winning somebody to Christ. Not all Christians have ever led someone else to faith in Christ. Does this separate the haves and the have-nots, or does it simply point out that some Christians do it and others don't? Now, obviously, none of this should become a point of pride or contention, but those tendencies are problems with attitude and maturity, not whether someone does or doesn't speak in tongues. Okay, that about wraps it up. I do encourage you guys to go and check out his other videos and watch the entirety of this one. He has a lot of good things to say on the topic. Hello everyone, SJ Newell here. Today we begin a series of videos in which we will be analyzing claims made by Alan Parr in a recent YouTube publication entitled, Five Bible Verses Many Charismatics, Word of Faith, and Pentecostals Take Out of Context exclamation point. Once again, I'm going to preface this critique by saying I believe Alan is a man of God and I'm thankful for the work that he's doing. This analysis is not meant as any kind of attack on him and I encourage everyone to check out more of his content. Now, Mr. Parr does not clarify in this video what exactly he means by the accusation of taking a verse out of its context. And as you'll see in our video that I'm linking to below, there are basically two very different meanings to these kinds of expressions. Without Alan's clarification, we won't be able to test the claims about context that he makes, but that's okay because we can still follow our usual format by making observations and identifying assumptions. Roll it. The first one is Romans chapter 4, verse 17. And I want to get this one out of the way early just in case you don't watch the rest of this video. Now this verse says, As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed, God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Now I want you to pay attention to this last phrase, and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. So you have a lot of charismatics and Pentecostals who will just take that one snippet of a verse and build an entire false theology around this idea that you and I have the creative power just as God did to speak words and if we speak these words, things will come into existence. Oh my friend, my friend. Look the more of these discussions I get into, I'm beginning to see a few common themes that almost always come up. One of these is how the position you're opposing gets worded word it one way and it can easily be dismissed or shown to be wrong word it another and it can become a reasonable and even formidable point of view now i can't exactly blame people for doing what i feel is a subpar job of stating these ideas because truth be told many of the proponents of these positions don't do the greatest job articulating them either so in a lot of respects mr parr is just repeating what he's heard from the horse's mouth and i can understand that but if it were me teaching on this topic, I would probably start by referencing the numerous passages and proverbs about the power of the tongue and words. Then go to the Gospels, particularly Mark 11.23, where Jesus had just finished speaking to a tree, and then told his disciples that whosoever speaks to a mountain and doesn't doubt will have whatever they say.
Then I'd point to the fact that a large percentage of the miraculous deeds Jesus performed, he performed by using words. He spoke to the wind and the waves, and they obeyed him. He spoke to sickness and disease, and they obeyed him. He spoke to a fig tree. He spoke to the dead. He spoke to the devil. In almost every area of Christ's ministry, he spoke, and what he said came to pass. But yeah, that was Jesus, you might say. But Jesus then went on to say this, I tell you the solemn truth. The person who believes in me will perform the miraculous deeds that I am doing and will perform greater deeds than these because I'm going to the Father. And then maybe after all of this, I would reference this passage here in Romans 4 and point out that God had changed Abram's name to Abraham so that between the time that God had changed his name and the time that the promise was manifested, Abraham would be calling and introducing himself as father of a multitude, something that he wasn't, or you could say something that did not exist. Rod Saunders over at Jew and Greek actually did an entire video on this subject. He does a good job of deflating a lot of the hysteria and adding some context to this idea. So if you want to know more about this angle, I'll link to it below. So when Mr. Parr says people are building an entire false theology around this little snippet of scripture, I guess I'd need to see an example of what he's talking about from an actual minister who does this. But what he may be seeing is Bible teachers using the terminology as a quick reference to the scriptures I just gave you. In other words, they could just be using this terminology as lingo or idioms. We all do this. When people say something like, God is sovereign, well, there is an ocean of ideology behind that. And just because someone doesn't take the time to break it all down, doesn't mean they're building theology around just that one quote. You also see these kinds of expressions change and become mingled with scripture. Like people will say, God decrees the end from the beginning. Or, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Even though the Bible doesn't really say either of those, these are scripture quotes and terms that over time begin to fuse together, but the audience typically understands what's in view, even if it's kind of messy. Like I said, without a real-world example of the use of this term, and a chance to sit down and dialogue with the person or persons who used it, we're not going to be able to verify Mr. Parr's claim that people are building an entire false theology around the reference. My friend, let's look at the context of uh, Romans chapter 4. First and foremost, Romans chapter 4 is a chapter that is talking about the process and the way of salvation. And it is a chapter that is about one man, a man named Abraham. And basically, God is trying to teach the Roman church how to become saved, which is always through faith. And he basically goes back to Abraham's uh, example and says, hey, just in case you think faith is a New Testament thing, the way of salvation has always been believing in God and get, um, um, exercising faith in God. So he uses Abraham as a prototype and says, hey, even Abraham, when he believed in God, it was credited to him as righteousness. What did Abraham have to believe? He had to believe that God was able to give life to a dead situation. This was a man who was 100 years old and his wife was close to 90 years old and her womb was dead. Their ability to give children was dead. She was barren and that was a dead situation. And yet God was the one who called a dead situation and caused life to come out of it, giving them Abraham, uh, excuse me, uh, Isaac as a child. So this verse is not about you and I speaking things into existence. That's not the context for it. And furthermore, who is the one in this verse that is even doing the calling and the speaking anyway? It is God who is able to call things into existence and call something that is not as if it were. Like I just mentioned, God had changed Abram's name to Abraham. So unless someone is arguing that Abraham never told anyone his name after that, then arguably it isn't just God that was calling things which do not exist as though they were. It was Abraham calling himself a father of multitudes. Nothing in this verse says that we have the ability to speak anything into existence. He is correct that this particular phrase is never used in reference to believers speaking, but like we mentioned prior from Proverbs, Mark 11, or John 14, there are other ways to demonstrate the same kind of idea. Romans 4.17 might come in as further support because it's an example of someone who believed and changed what they said to line up with what God said about them. And as a result, what was said came into existence. 
Hopefully I got that across because so many Christians, so many of you watching this, you're throwing that phrase around. Oh, I speak this into a Don't speak it into existence. That is not biblical. And that's not what the scriptures teach. Well, uh, okay. He's ending here with a conclusion that is slightly different from his original premise. He started out with a stated objective to address scripture that is taken out of context. In this video, I want to talk about five very common verses that many charismatic and Pentecostal preachers are taking out of context and leading so many people astray. But ended with a conclusion about an entire ideology being false. That is not biblical, and that's not what the scriptures teach. Those are two different things. A scripture can be taken out of context to be used and support for an idea that is actually true. So even if he were able to demonstrate Romans 4.17 was taken out of context, which as we already demonstrated may or may not be the case depending on how it's being used and how you define the terms, the conclusion that calling things into existence is therefore false doesn't necessarily follow. Now, I'm not trying to be overly technical or confuse anyone, but we just got to be careful that a claim isn't being tacked onto the end here without being checked up on. Okay, my friends, we will pause it here, but do not fret. Part two will be coming out shortly. Thanks for watching. Hey guys, SJ Newell back to continue our series on analyzing claims made by Alan Parr in his video, Five Bible Verses Many Charismatics, Word of Faith, and Pentecostals Take Out of Context. This will be part two. Check out below for a link to part one, and let's jump right back in. Okay, so the next one is Isaiah 53, verse 5, which says, And by his stripes we are healed. Now, this is a real common one. I've talked about this one before, but many charismatics and Pentecostals who believe in divine healing will use this scripture to suggest that somehow within the salvation work of Christ on the cross, that included in that entire package of salvation is the very fact that every single believer is healed physically because of the death of Jesus Christ. To maybe help with perspective and context on this, I'd like to mention at this point that I know a lot of people who would not consider themselves charismatic, Pentecostal, or word of faith that believe Isaiah 53, 5 includes physical healing. In fact, I don't know if Alan would consider Mike Winger as one of these types that are leading people astray. But Winger just recently came out with a video where he admits that the text is indeed about physical healing. I also don't know if Mr. Parr would consider a guy like R.C. Sprawl to be Word of Faith or Pentecostal. But he also says in this video that the text includes physical healing. Once again, look at the context of Isaiah chapter 53 and even look at the entire book of Isaiah and you will see that that word healed in the book of Isaiah refers to a spiritual healing of God's people and has nothing to do with a physical healing. I have no doubt that there are many instances in the book of Isaiah where the primary emphasis of the word healed is spiritual. I don't think anyone would argue that, but that doesn't mean it exclusively means spiritual healing every time it occurs in the book. Nor is there going to be a way to verify such an idea because the word spiritual doesn't even occur in the Isaiah. So I don't know what he means by you will see. And you will see if he means that some will read the book and agree with him. Well, OK, yeah, some will see it, but others will see physical healing as well. That's one issue with abstract claims regarding the context. They're open to debate. It's just going to boil down to whatever seems the most reasonable to the reader. And since different things make different degrees of sense to different readers, you're going to get people who agree, disagree, and everything in between on any given text when using this method. We talk about this in our video on context. I linked to it in the last video. Here it is again. Now, there are some things about context that virtually no one will disagree with, even though they're not actually stated in the text. For example, in Matthew 8, it says, When evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a word, and healed all who were sick, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Even though it doesn't say Jesus healed people physically here, I don't know anyone who would argue that this is what the verse is in reference to. And it just so happens that Matthew is quoting from Isaiah 53. So, it turns out, physical healing is part of the context of Isaiah 53, and is actually mentioned only one verse prior to the statement that is in question. So, 
what method of reading the Bible or hermeneutic would allow us to exclude physical healing after it was just referred to only one sentence prior? We need to be careful that we're not using context as some kind of all-purpose scapegoat for things we don't want to accept in Scripture. I'm going to link to an article that deals more with this topic and explores a kind of pseudo-intellectualism that seems to have invaded the church under the guise of some of these terms. But even if Matthew had not referenced from Isaiah 53, there is still a way to show that the context of the chapter includes physical healing. And that's to simply ask, who is the we and the we are healed of this verse? As human beings, we're not disembodied spirits. We aren't just spiritual, we're flesh and blood. Spirit, soul, as well as body. Jesus said that which is born of the flesh is flesh. God said about man in Genesis that he is indeed flesh. That's who we are. With this understanding, we could read the verse like this. He was wounded for our spirit, soul, and body's transgressions, and bruised for our spirit, soul, and body's iniquities. And by his stripes, we, spirit, soul, and body, are healed. But if we exclude the body from Isaiah 53, 5, and I'm still uncertain why we would choose to do this, it would read like this. He was wounded for our spirit and soul's transgressions and bruised for our spirit and soul's iniquities, which would leave sins of the flesh unaccounted and, I guess, unatoned for? It just gets unnecessarily weird trying to abstract the body from this verse. As a matter of fact, if you look at the rest of the context of this verse and the verses around it, everything in this context is talking about God's ability to save us from our sins in terms of a spiritual healing. Notice it says here, but he was wounded for our what? Transgressions. That's a term that's talking about sin. He was bruised for our iniquities. Another term that talks about sin. I could be missing Alan's point and he or anyone else is welcome to clarify but I thought the topic of discussion was demonstrating that physical healing isn't in verse 5. So how is anything he says here connected to that? I mean, I agree that things like sin and forgiveness is definitely being talked about. But so what? What's the connection between references to sin and the conclusion that a text rules out physical healing? We already pointed out Matthew's reference to physical healing literally just one verse before verse 5. And the fact that sin isn't just a spiritual thing. Man is spirit, soul, and body. But there are various other places where these ideas are all mentioned together in Scripture. How about James 5, which mentions the sick being healed alongside the confession and forgiveness of sins. In John 15, Jesus tells a blind man he had just healed to stop sinning lest a worse thing happen to him. Deuteronomy 28 mentions the punishment for sinning as every sickness and every disease. Or how about the fact that most Christians agree that the arrival of physical corruption into the earth in the first place happened because of Adam and Eve's transgression in the garden? The chastisement for our peace was upon him, speaking of salvation. Actually, peace is an interesting term, and the meaning includes soundness in body, welfare, health, and prosperity. So, once again, we have a reference to the body in the text. And by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. That's talking about our sinful disobedience. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Iniquity is another term for sin. So once again, you may hear somebody preaching with power. I declare right now over you that by his stripes, we are healed. You are healed in the name of Jesus. Listen, I believe that God can heal us at any time because God is the same yesterday and today and forever. But that does not, this is not the verse that you want to use to suggest that God must heal every single believer. It's taken out of context, and we need to stop using it in the incorrect way. I've heard dozens and dozens of testimonies of people being healed by believing and confessing Isaiah 53, 5. I've had it work in my own life multiple times. So for myself and many, many others, Mr. Parr is simply too late in his recommendation of not using this verse for physical healing. But obviously, anyone is free to take Alan's advice here. All right, that's it for this video. There will be a part three coming shortly. Thanks, guys.
Hello everyone, I'm SJ Newell, and in this video, we will be picking up where we left off in our series analyzing Alan Parr's YouTube publication entitled, Five Bible Verses, Many Charismatics, Word of Faith, and Pentecostals Take Out of Context. This is part three. I'll link to his original video as well as the previous two below. If you're wondering about our format or terminology for these videos, I'll also link to our ground rules. Okay, the third one is Deuteronomy 8.18, which says, And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant that he swore to your fathers as it is this day. Now, I love this one because many charismatics and Pentecostals will just take that little phrase, God has given you the power to get wealth, to suggest that every single believer should be wealthy and God has given you the power to do that. Okay, before we explore Mr. Parr's claims in any depth, I just wanted to preface the analysis by saying, even if the claims were found to be true, this would not equate to proving that every single believer should not be wealthy. As we mentioned in our first video, it's possible to use a verse incorrectly to support an idea that is true. For example, if I quoted from Genesis where Cain kills Abel and I said, see, this is a foreshadow of Paul's road to Damascus conversion. Well, no, it isn't. That would be an incorrect conclusion from the verse. But it is still true that Paul did have a road to Damascus conversion. So identifying any error charismatics commit in the use of this verse isn't going to tell us whether or not every believer should be wealthy. It would just tell us that an error was committed in the use of the verse. All right, then you're probably wondering, well, should every believer be wealthy? And we deal with that topic in our second video on American Gospel, which I'll link to. We also have an FAQ on many other related questions that you can find below. Anyway, going back to Alan's premise, similar to what we pointed out in our first video, it's possible this citation from Deuteronomy that he feels is being taken out of context is like the calling things into existence or God decrees the end from the beginning sayings, where people who quote them are not intending for them to be taken as be-all, end-all statements in support of an ideology, but lingo or even an allegorical reference to broader support. So, for example, one might cite Deuteronomy 8 as the umbrella term or verse under which many other statements and promises regarding prosperity in the Bible would fall, such as all the verses in Proverbs or Psalms, or when Jesus said that we would have a hundredfold of houses and lands with persecutions, or 2 Corinthians 8, 9 that talks about Jesus becoming poor, that we, through his poverty, might become rich. Or 1 Corinthians 3, 21 and 22, where it talks about all things being ours, not just future things, but present things and even the world. Now, is it possible that people aren't using this verse as lingo or an allegorical reference, but as Alan is claiming here in that they're taking this one little phrase to suggest every single believer should be wealthy? Absolutely. But again, like we mentioned in our first video, in order to verify this for sure, we would need an actual example where this is supposedly taking place in context. Then we would probably need to sit down with the person from that example and ask clarifying questions to ensure this is the case. And even if we did find one or two preachers who do this, that obviously isn't going to tell us if it's normative among Pentecostals, Charismatics, or Word of Faith people. So, if this is what Alan means when he talks about many of these folks are doing it, the many would need to be further defined before it could be verified as either true, false, or somewhere in between. Deuteronomy chapter 8 is a chapter where Moses is giving the children of Israel instructions for how to basically act and how to conduct themselves once they get into the promised land. And basically Moses is telling them, hey, whenever you get in there, you're gonna have houses that you did not build. There's gonna be wells that you did not dig. There's gonna be all these blessings because this is the promised land and God is gonna bless you so much. So whenever you get in there, don't get the big head, don't get cocky, don't forget God, remain humble and understand that this is a test that God has taken you through in the wilderness so that he could bless you with these things. And so he's telling them how to conduct themselves whenever God blesses them with this wealth so that they will remember that it was God that gave them the ability to obtain all of these things. This all sounds true. My friend, this chapter 
wasn't even written to you and I. It was written to the nation of Israel from Moses. So we can't just take one little snippet of a verse that wasn't even written to you and I and build an entire theology around it. That would be like me getting a love letter that was written to somebody else, reading it and saying, oh, I'm so glad that this person feels this way about me. No, it wasn't even written to me. It was written to my friend. That is what we do whenever we take something out of context and try to apply it to our own life. While it may be true these statements weren't written to us, and even that's debatable, and we'll get to that in a second, that doesn't necessarily mean they don't apply to us. Mr. Parr uses the example of a love letter, and with that example, he would be right. But I could give the example of, say, a graduation speech. Things said in a graduation speech almost always apply to a broader audience than those being addressed in the moment. Another angle we could take on this is to point out that the Bible is a supernatural book. In some ways, it's like other books, but in others, it's completely unique. To my knowledge, there are no verses anywhere that tell us that God's Word is bound by traditional ideas of literacy. The reason I bring this up is because New Testament authors often quoted from the Old Testament without the mention of any kind of disclaimer of exclusion to their audiences. For example, in a letter to the Ephesians, God buttresses the instruction for children to obey their parents by quoting from the law given to the Israelites. It even goes one step further and tells Christians there is a promise of long life and goodness associated with this commandment. No mention anywhere that the command wasn't to them or the promise not for them. At one point, Paul references from Leviticus 26 and says to the Corinthians, therefore having these promises. Think about that. He writes to former pagans under the new covenant, quotes a statement written to Israel under the old covenant, and yet still tells them they have these promises. Now, am I saying that because some parts of the Old Testament are quoted and applied to believers in the New Testament, this therefore means we should assume the same of Deuteronomy 8.18? No. But we also can't rule out the possibility like Mr. Parr seems to be doing here. At least not without a clear and verifiable statement in Scripture telling us as much. So we would have to say Alan's claim that it wasn't written to us cannot be verified at this point and thus falls under the category of an assumption. Finally, what I'm about to say will probably make some heads explode. Because we're often taught certain assumptions about the way the Bible should be read, and when we see others not going along with those assumptions, it can seem outrageous to us. But just because we hold to certain preconceived notions doesn't mean others have to. No matter how many appeals to popularity or authority that we try to make. I'll link to a video below that talks more about this. Anyway, at this point I'm going to invoke Romans 8.32 for this discussion. We also have a short video on this, which I'll link to below. But in this section of scripture, Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, asks a profound question that I really think puts things into perspective. He who did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all other things. Of course, the implied answer is that he will graciously give us all other things with Christ, and this fact can be shown in various ways in other scriptures, one of which we already cited earlier. So bear with me here a second. The power to get wealth is a thing, right? I mean, it's a noun, and since it isn't a person or a place, that would make it a thing. This verse asks, how will God not graciously give us all other things? things along with Christ. So, to be more precise, we could ask Romans 8.32 this way, If God spared not his own Son, how shall he not with him also graciously give us the power to get wealth? To tie this all together, even if we assumed Deuteronomy 8.18 wasn't written to the believer and didn't apply to the believer, the question God asked in Romans would cover it anyway. Now, like I mentioned prior, due to certain preconceived notions about how the Bible ought to be read, people are going to argue my conclusion is flawed here. And I'm open to hearing from you guys. But as far as dealing with the text itself, I really don't see a way around this one. The truth is, there are a handful of passages like Romans 8.32 that could be used to rebut almost any criticism of what's often referred to as word of faith or prosperity gospel doctrines. 
I just don't usually invoke these because they're so simple that people do often end up stumbling over them. Usually we want to hear longer, more technical arguments, and obviously we can go that route too. But for change of pace, I thought I'd bring one of these passages up. That's gonna do it guys. Thanks for watching. Hey guys, it's your friendly analyst SJ Newell here bringing you the fourth and final installment of our investigation into claims made by Alan Parr in a video entitled Five Bible Verses Many Charismatics, Word of Faith, and Pentecostals Take Out of Context. Before delving back in, I wanted to let you guys know that we will be skipping number four on Alan's list because Rod Saunders over at Jew and Greek actually addressed this specific clip in one of his recent videos and I don't really have much to add to it. So I'll link to that below if you want to check it out. Okay, roll it. And number five, Matthew 18, 18, which says, Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, a lot of times during a real emotionally driven and powerful prayer service, you might hear a charismatic or a Pentecostal lay hands on somebody and say, I bind you, Satan, in the name of Jesus. You have no part here. I bind you, Satan. I bind the devil from this place. My friend, listen, this context is not talking about that. If you go back and look at the context of Matthew chapter 18, it's talking about church discipline. It's talking about how God is giving the apostles the ability to exercise church discipline when one brother dis, uh, sins against another brother. And basically what God is saying is, hey, I'm passing on the authority to you all so that however you, whatever you bind on earth, I will support and bind in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth, I will uh, loose in heaven. And that's why he goes on later in this chapter and says, hey, if two or three of you are are gathered together in agreement, then there I will be in the midst of you saying, hey, if this is how you all agree as, ap as apostles in authority, then I will be in the midst of that. We're going to break this down by starting out with some observations about the text itself and what we can say for sure about it. Then we'll explore a little about the context. So dealing with the actual text, Jesus uses the term whatever or whatsoever which is obviously very broad and essentially has no limits. This fact alone makes this an open and shut case, whatever would include the devil. Now, like we have stated several times before, Alan or anyone else may choose to add in their own limits to this or any other scripture, which, don't get me wrong, we all do to one degree or another. But here's the important thing to realize about these kinds of additions. They're not authoritative because they're not mentioned in the verse. That means whatever disclaimers, assumptions, or exceptions you cake on here, don't be surprised if your charismatic friends aren't willing to go along with you. Remember, the Bible is our authority, not the Bible plus your or my commentary. That's the long and short of it. But context is king, right? All right, let's zoom out a little further and look at the broader context for a moment. Matthew 18 isn't the only place Jesus said these words. In Matthew 16, 19, he told the same thing to Peter, but in this context, there is no mention of church discipline, of offenses and forgiveness between brethren. Instead, it's prefaced by Jesus stating that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. The gates of hell. I'd imagine most Christians would agree the devil and his crew would be a part of that. And if you do, then you'd have to agree that the context here does include the devil. What's also interesting to note is that both Matthew 12 and Mark 3, where one of the topics being discussed by Jesus is the matter of casting out of demons, Christ makes a curious statement, but no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man, then indeed he may plunder his house. Looking at some commentaries, the consensus among Christians seems to be that the strong man is Satan who gets bound by Christ. Now remember, in Matthew's account, Jesus had just finished casting a demon out of a person before making the statement about binding the strong man. In Mark's account, Jesus had just given his disciples the ability to cast out demons before mentioning the binding of the strong man. 
So to recap, you have Jesus casting out devils, giving authority to his disciples to cast out devils, then making a statement which most seem to agree is a reference to binding the devil, all within the same context. Then in Matthew 16, you have Jesus mentioning the gates of hell right before talking about binding and loosing. And then, of course, it's repeated in chapter 18. So when we consider all of these other factors within the broader context, can we say for certain that the devil is excluded from the words Jesus spoke here? Now, some of you will think what I just explained sounds reasonable. Others are going to be completely unmoved and maintain the context still does not allow for the devil. And that's the thing about these sorts of claims. It's kind of like looking at Rorschach ink blots. People simply see different things in it. And trying to get to the bottom of why we think we see what we do in the context has been one of the greatest debates within Christianity for centuries. Here at The Objective Believer, we try to eliminate a lot of this kind of obscurity and guesswork by taking a different approach than most ministries out there when it comes to the Bible. This is done by putting the emphasis on observations that can be made by anyone in the actual text itself. And in this case, as we pointed out prior, Jesus uses the word whatever, which is a determiner used to emphasize a lack of restriction and no exceptions are mentioned in the passage and any which are added simply cannot be verified. All of that said, putting aside Matthew 18, there is quite a bit more the Bible has to say on this subject, and we will get to it in just a second. Now, what does the Bible say about the devil? Well, number one, it says that the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. That verse does not suggest that you and I have the ability to bind him up or to uh, lock him up in some way. This doesn't sound like a falsifiable claim. I don't know how one goes about demonstrating what a verse does not suggest. That verse does not suggest that you and I have the ability to bind him up. You could reword it and say the verse doesn't mention anything about binding the devil. That would certainly be a falsifiable claim. Learn more about falsifiability by watching our video on the topic. Not only that, the Bible says that the only time the devil is going to be bound is at the second coming of Christ where uh, Christ binds him in uh, the lake of fire for a thousand years during the millennial kingdom. It doesn't talk about us binding him up. Actually, Revelation 20 does not say the only time the devil would be bound is when Christ binds him for a thousand years. It's possible Mr. Parr misspoke and meant to say that the only time the Bible mentions the devil being bound is in Revelation 20. But obviously, those are two different claims. Something not being mentioned isn't the same as something not happening. Drawing conclusions from the absence of statements is what's known as an argument from silence. There's also a matter of semantics that would need to be explored here. People often use the devil as a term to describe demons and demonic activity in general. So even if we assumed Revelation 20 said the only time the devil would be bound is when Christ binds him for a thousand years, that wouldn't necessarily include demons and demonic activity. Not only that, in Jude chapter 1 verse 9, even the archangel Michael, when he was uh, fighting with the devil about the body of Moses, did not even... Uh, try to rebuke the devil, but said, Jesus, you need to rebuke him. So if angels can't rebuke the devil and bind the devil, then my friend, you and I aren't able to do that either. I'm glad Alan brought up this passage because in the past few years, I've been seeing it make the rounds in certain circles that are critical of charismatics and being invoked to support some of the same kinds of ideas he's suggesting here. So let's address it now. First, I'm not going to pretend to understand everything that is being talked about in this passage of Jude but there are some things we can definitively point out about it. Number one, it does not say angels cannot or could not rebuke the devil. That claim would be an assumption. Secondly, even if we were willing to make that assumption, it would be an additional assumption to conclude that this therefore means believers also cannot. So you've got an assumption within an assumption going on here. Something, isn't it? It is. Before moving on, I wanted to harken back to something Alan talked about in point four, which was not covered, but you can see in his original video. Huge mistake in Bible interpretation is to see an isolated incident in the Word of God 
take it out of context and say, okay, because this happened to this person or this small group of people, then therefore that must be the experience universally for every Christian. That is not proper biblical interpretation and it'll get you in trouble every single time. I don't know if Alan feels the event in Jude is some kind of exception to what he is saying here. But I agree with what he's saying here. I would not recommend taking a weird and isolated incident of Michael contending with Satan over the body of Moses and arriving at some kind of conclusion for all Christians. The Bible also says that the devil is the prince of this world, meaning he is going to be largely influencing what goes on in this world until Christ returns. True. Before I let you guys go, I just wanted to demonstrate that even if we assumed Matthew 18, 18 excludes binding the devil, practically speaking, it wouldn't really matter because the Bible often provides more than one way to arrive at essentially the same truth. For starters, Jesus said in Mark 16 that one sign that would follow believers is that in the name of Jesus, they would cast out devils. Meanings for the word name here include authority, rank, and whatever else comes to mind upon hearing it. So Jesus tells us that with his authority and ranking, we will drive out demons. We could put John 14, 12 in here as well. Jesus said the works he did, we would do also. What are some of the works Jesus did? He spoke to and rebuked the devil. He exercised complete authority over the forces of darkness. Also, the Bible commands the believer to resist the devil. Now, if believers didn't have authority or power over the devil, it would stand to reason that you wouldn't be able to resist him. Yet James says not only to resist him, but that he would flee from you as a result. It doesn't even say the devil would flee from God here. It says he flees from you. When's the last time someone that was stronger or had more power than you ran away from you? Or how about Paul's statement to the Ephesians to give the devil no place and no opportunity? Again, think about the power and ability one would have to possess in order to be able to fulfill this command. And here's the clincher. John tells us in multiple places in his first letter that we have overcome spirits which are not of God, and we have overcome the wicked one. If you do a word study on overcome used in these verses, it means that we have conquered or taken control of by use of military force, the wicked one, and these evil spirits. So, if you can cast out, drive out, rebuke, resist, give no place, no opportunity, overcome, conquer, and take control of the devil, well, binding has got to fall under at least one of those. As far as I can tell, any objection to the practice of binding the devil at this point would just be a matter of semantics. Okay guys, I hope you enjoyed this series. Remember, I'm always open to hearing constructive criticism. So if I said something in this or any other video that wasn't true, let me know. Hello everyone, SJ Newell for The Objective Believer here. Thanks for tuning in. Per your requests, up on the docket today, another Alan Parr publication. This time he's talking about the Believer's Authority and we're going to break it down. As a reminder, all these videos are ongoing discussions. This isn't about owning Alan Parr, exposing him, or destroying his arguments. I think it's high time the body of Christ to get out of such a mentality and started being a little more loving and respectable in how we engage with one another. Okay, go. What authority do believers really have in Christ? I mean, this is the question that we really want to ask and answer, right? Do believers have this authority to basically do the same things that Jesus did and Jesus' disciples did? And we're going to take a look at that, hopefully, and answer that question in this video. And so the scripture in question is Matthew chapter 17, verse 20, and it says this. You don't have enough faith, Jesus told them. I tell you the truth. If you had faith even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it would move. 
nothing would be impossible. So from this one verse, many people have built an entire theology around it as they do many verses. They take them out of context and they build this theology and they basically say, you know what? There it is, case closed. Jesus said, if I have enough faith, then I could make mountains move. I can speak to the mountain and it is going to move. But the question we have to ask is, what is this verse actually saying and what was Jesus actually teaching here? I don't know if that's a question we have to ask. I mean, we could just believe what it says, that if you had faith, even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there and it would move. Here's something to keep in mind when it comes to Bible commentary. What we say about God's Word will never be as meaningful, impactful, or reflective of the mind and will of God as what God's Word says on its own. Now, we're going to dig into exactly what this verse is talking about, the context of it and all of that. But before I get to that, let me just address this idea of the believer's authority in Jesus Christ. And the way I see it, there are really three possibilities as it relates to this idea of authority. Possibility number one, Jesus has given every single believer the authority to perform supernatural miracles just as Jesus did and Jesus' disciples. Something I have frequently pointed out before is that there is often more than one road to get to the same truth. No, I'm not talking about anything new agey here. What I mean is how you word a claim will often determine whether or not it can be biblically substantiated. For example, there is no scripture that explicitly states that Jesus gave every believer the authority to perform miracles. So if we accept the premise the way that Alan framed it and begin to investigate, we're never going to come up with anything concrete. All we will be able to do is make our best cases for or against it. On the other hand, I could take what Alan said, tweak it a little, and find a direct observation of it in the Bible. Let me demonstrate. First, I'll start by pointing out that the scriptures record Jesus performing miraculous deeds, right? Once that's established, we then could go to John 14, 12, where he said those who believe will perform the same miraculous deeds that he did and even greater. So notice what I did there. I got us to essentially the same destination as Mr. Parr's possibility number one. I just took a different route, one that can actually be biblically verified. Now it's airtight because it's straight from the Bible. There are other ways to demonstrate this as well. Mark 16, 17 through 18 talks about believers using the name of Jesus, which means authority, by the way, to cast out devils and heal the sick. Or Mark 9, 23, where it simply states all things, not all things except having the authority to perform miracles, but all things are possible to those who believe. We could even use Romans 8.32 in here. If you don't know how Romans 8.32 would play into this, we've got some content you can check out below that I think will make it pretty clear. Of course, it's about this time in the video that folks start in with accusations that I'm taking passages out of their context. I get that a lot, so we have some content responding to these claims as well below. Now, I clearly do not believe that this is the case. And all you have to do to disprove that is go out there and try to speak to a mountain and make it move. It probably ain't going to happen, right? Or maybe go down to the hospital and try to heal all the people there that are sick, right? People who have COVID, people who have cancer, go and just pray a prayer over them and see if you have the supernatural ability to heal all those people. Or maybe go to a uh, sporting event that has a huge stadium and take two fish with you and five loaves of bread and see if you can feed 5,000, 10,000 people, right? It ain't gonna happen. So I don't believe that option number one, which is this idea that Jesus has transferred the authority to every single believer to perform supernatural miracles throughout all time is a potential option. Okay, so a couple of thoughts here. First of all, having just demonstrated in multiple ways that the believer will do and can do the same miraculous works that Jesus did, the option that this isn't true is, of course, not on the table. It is true because that's what the Bible says. Now, obviously, some of you are wondering, what about Alan's point? If we can truly do these things, why aren't people going into hospitals and healing all the sick or multiplying food at a sporting event? 
First of all, whether you ever get answers to such questions or not isn't going to change what the Bible already says about the matter. Believers will perform the same miraculous deeds that Jesus did, and even greater. All things are possible to the one who believes. These are facts. One thing I've observed among critics of Charismatics is they often warn against elevating experiences above the Word of God. And I do agree that can definitely lead to error. This is why I would caution against allowing your experiences to dictate how you view God's Word instead of allowing God's Word to dictate how you view your experiences. Let me unpack that just a little more. There seems to be this prevailing mentality in the body of Christ that all one has to do in order to justify changing or rejecting God's Word is to point to something it says that it doesn't seem to harmonize with our limited human experience. I've never seen X, nor heard about it happening, therefore God must have meant Y. Or, I tried to do X, and it didn't work, therefore that passage couldn't possibly be referring to X. Truth doesn't always fit within our ability to understand. Even the world recognizes this kind of erroneous thinking and gave it a name, Appeal to Incredulity Fallacy. We have a video that talks about it. This is one thing I've found about quote-unquote word of faith theology that I haven't seen in any other circles, and it's really a primary reason I've stuck around all these years. All the other brands of Christianity I've come across arrive at doctrine through a kind of hybrid of scripture and experience, which is sort of what Abraham and Sarah did. If you remember, God gave them a promise of a child, but what they saw and felt told them Sarah was too old to conceive. By mixing experience with the promise, they got an Ishmael instead of an Isaac. On the other hand, one of the cornerstones of Word of Faith theology is it doesn't matter what you see, what you feel, or what you think. These are never excuses to make changes to what the Bible plainly says. When this conviction is applied in a practical way, yes, you often do end up with unanswered questions and loose ends. But that's a thousand times preferred over altering or dumbing down something that God said. Having noted this, I'll now attempt to take a stab at the issue Alan raises. So why aren't we seeing Christians go into hospitals and heal all the sick or multiplying food at a sporting event? First of all, I don't know anyone who has even tried either of these two particular scenarios. Do you? So that may partially answer the question. Obviously, if you don't attempt to do something, that's going to cut down on the possibility of it being done. I have heard from multiple people who have gone to hospitals to pray for some strangers that often they're not even allowed in. So the cooperation of the hospitals and the sick inside may factor into this. There are, however, countless testimonies of healings and other similar works of Jesus being done by believers all over the world. I'll link to an article below that references some. So I'm not sure why Alan chose these particular two scenarios instead of one of these more common instances. That being said, a lot of resources on the topic of why we fail to walk in the supernatural exist out there. To name a couple, I would recommend anything by Curry Blake or Kenneth E. Hagen. They get into much more detail than I'm going to be able to hear. But I think Alan touches on a, probably the primary answer to this question in his next clip. So let's take a look. Now, the second possibility is that Jesus has given believers the authority to perform the supernatural if they have enough faith. Okay, so as I mentioned a second ago, the Bible often provides more than one way to get to essentially the same truth. Let's look at the passage Alan just cited, Matthew 17, 20. You don't have enough faith, Jesus told them. I tell you the truth, if you had faith, even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it would move. Nothing would be impossible. Also, as previously mentioned, John 14, 12, those who believe in him, the miraculous deeds he did, they will do also. Again, we could also refer to Mark 9, 23 here. All things are possible for who? Just anybody? Nope. The one who believes. James 5 says the prayer of faith will make the sick person well. To my knowledge, no promise of a prayer of doubt accomplishing the same outcome exists in scripture. In all these passages, it's the person who believes that is able to perform the miraculous. 
So going back to the question of why haven't we seen Christians going to hospitals to clear them out or trying to multiply food at a sporting event? Well, if they're not trying to do it, that may be a pretty good indicator that they don't believe they can. Hence, there's no premise that it would happen. So you're saying if a miracle doesn't happen, it's because of our lack of faith and it's our fault? Well, I wouldn't put it that way because the Bible doesn't say it that way. What I would say, however, is what I just said. In all the aforementioned passages, it's the person who believes that is able to do the miraculous. I'll leave any conclusions about what this means for those who do not believe up to the audience. But it's not rocket science. Now, the problem with this particular view is that it still suggests that the authority lies within the believer and not within God. It suggests that, you know what, my faith, if I have enough faith, I'm able to somehow override the will of God and I'm able to make some things happen that very well may or may not be in God's perfect will, but because I had the faith to be able to make this thing happen, then as a result, I can actually make it happen and bring it to pass. Let me give you a silly example of this. Let's just say that it is God's will for there to be a rainstorm to come because God wants some plants to grow. But you want to play golf. And you know that that rain is going to ruin your plans to play golf. Well, according to this view, if you have enough faith, you can speak to the, the winds and the waves and the storm and basically be able to say, you know what? Hey, peace be still, right? Do not rain, do not storm, because I have enough faith to override whatever it is that God is wanting to do. There's two routes we can take in addressing what he's saying here. The first one is to just stick with what is observable in the Bible. We already demonstrated from multiple scriptures that, yes, the miraculous is preceded by faith or a person who believes. Whatever problems Alan perceives or describes here isn't going to change that. As alluded to prior, some truths are just hard to accept and present us with all kinds of dilemmas, both emotional, logical, and sometimes even moral. But they're still true. Or as Ben Shapiro once put it, facts don't care about your feelings. At the objective believer, this will nearly always be our default position. Emphasize what the Bible says, regardless of how it makes you feel. But the other route we could take is to engage his argument and offer a counter. This is different from the other approach, because instead of simply making observations in Scripture, and essentially just saying, sorry you have problems with it, but that's what the Bible says. We are now attempting to fill in blanks, tie up loose ends, and smooth out any bumps that may grate on our intellect or feelings. As I've mentioned on numerous occasions and go into greater detail about in this article, the drawback of taking this route is it's subjective. But this appears to be the game most want to play in the body of Christ, so I'll show you guys that I can play it too by offering two hypothetical counter-arguments to what Alan just said here. So one way of explaining it is, if it isn't God's will, you wouldn't be able to have faith for it in the first place. Kenneth E. Hagen taught this concept and used to say, faith begins where the will of God is known. So there is no problem, as Alan describes, because you're not overriding his will. Instead, through prayer, study of the word, and the leading of the spirit, you discover what God's will is, and this empowers your faith to believe for it. Now, what I like about this explanation is it doesn't cause any tension with the passages I mentioned earlier. See, if you say, yes, all things are possible for those who believe, unless it isn't within the will of God, well, you just created a conflict because Jesus said all things are possible and you're saying, no, not really all things. On the other hand, if we simply remove the disclaimer from the words of Jesus and added it to our end on the question of what we are able to believe for, Mark 9.23 and other similar passages are not compromised. Another alternative explanation to Allen's is we do things all the time that are contrary to God's will. God tells us to obey the governing authorities, but we drive above the speed limit anyway. God tells us honor our father and mother, but we disrespect them anyway. God tells us to pray, but we decide to binge Netflix instead. Over and over again, God expresses his will and what we are to do, and yet we override it and do the opposite. So why are we treating the performing of miracles as if they have to be bound by God's will when these other things very clearly are not? Let me give an example along the same lines as Alan's. 
let's say your golf game indeed got rained out because it was God's will. And in frustration, you cuss out your caddy. Well, how were you able to do that? I mean, who gave you the breath in your lungs and tongue in your mouth to bring to pass such a thing? These are all gifts from God, aren't they? If you punch that caddy in the face, who gave you the strength, the muscles, the coordination for that? God did. So even though it was contrary to his will, even though he instructed you not to do it, you were still able to take abilities he bestowed and use them to accomplish your desires. So there appears to be an assumption being made that faith and the supernatural are somehow in a separate category from all the other gifts and abilities God grants to us that we use both for and against God's will. Now again, those are hypothetical arguments. I'm not necessarily saying they're true. I'm just using them to demonstrate that there's more than one way to frame this discussion. And the issues Alan raises here can be explained. Maybe you don't think those are good explanations. Others will. Like I said, it's a subjective arena. But to harken back to our default position mentioned earlier, what can we say for sure? In all these passages, it's the person who believes that is able to perform the miraculous. And no such promises are given to the one who doubts. Another problem here is that you're also setting up a situation where if the supernatural event does not occur, then man is left to feel guilty because, hey, you know what? The only reason why my friend didn't get healed, the only reason why this miracle didn't happen, the only reason why this particular person died was because I, the person who was able to pray over them or to perform this miracle, did not have enough faith to believe God to bring it to pass, which then creates another huge problem. Well, there's no use in letting yourself feel condemned. We fall short in all kinds of ways when it comes to serving God and just life in general. In fact, as we will see later on in Alan's video, the disciples even experienced something similar to this. But the Bible says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. So why mope around about it when you can walk in love, joy, and peace that passes all understanding? However, what you most certainly do not want to do is ignore or alter what the Bible says about faith in the miraculous because it hurts your feelings. That's going to do it for this video. We'll pick up where we left off in the next. Thanks, guys. Hello, everyone. I'm SJ Newell, and welcome to The Objective Believer. Today, we will be finishing up a two-part response slash rebuttal to one of Alan Parr's recent videos on the topic of the believer's authority. When we last left off, Alan was explaining some problems he perceived with the idea that every believer has the authority for miracles if they have enough faith. Please don't watch this if you haven't first watched part one. I had to literally cut this response in half, and so all the context for this discussion can be found in that first installment. Let's go. Another problem with this view is that Jesus clearly says here that if you had the faith of a mustard seed, which was the smallest seeds that the disciples would have been familiar with at that time. So now we're basically saying, wow, if Jesus is saying, if you just had the faith of a mustard seed, you could perform these great miracles, then that makes it even worse because now you're saying that 99.99% .99 of all Christians everywhere throughout all time didn't even have the faith of a mustard seed. Okay, for starters, I don't know where he's getting his numbers from. I would say anywhere from 35 to 50% of the Christians I know have seen and or done the same type of miraculous deeds that Jesus did. Testimonies of healings and miracles are normative among charismatics. Now, whether you believe these testimonies or not, well, that's up to you. And maybe that's the angle Mr. Parr is coming from on this. Maybe he believes that 99.99% .99 of Christians throughout all time have not been able to perform a miracle because he rejects most of the claims out there. That's his prerogative. But that, of course, would mean the problem he raises here is predicated on making certain assumptions that not everybody is willing to make. A lot of us would choose to give the benefit of the doubt and accept these sorts of testimonies that are coming out of every corner of the planet. And for those of us, such as myself, who have experienced it firsthand, it isn't a testimony. It's a fact. See, in other words, Christians throughout all history don't have any faith 
at all because it says if I just had a little bit, I could make miracles happen. I'm not sure what he's saying here, but if he is equating not having a mustard seed of faith to no faith at all, the Bible doesn't say that. So I have no way to verify this sort of claim. If you're not familiar with the concept of falsifiability, I'll link to a video below that gets into it. Before moving on, I'm going to throw out a few observations concerning the idea of faith and a mustard seed. First of all, other translations of this verse says faith as a mustard seed or like a mustard seed. Now, at the Objective Believer, we don't get into translation debates. I accept all mainstream versions and translations as complementing, not contradicting one another. So I'm not saying the translation Alan is using here is wrong, but it is just one angle. Obviously, something being the size of a mustard seed is quite different from something being like or as a mustard seed. Let me demonstrate what I mean. A few chapters before this instance, Jesus made a different comparison using a mustard seed. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds, but when it is grown, it is greater than the herbs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. Obviously, if Jesus had only said the kingdom of heaven is the size of a mustard seed, that would not only be a little weird, it wouldn't really tell us much. But he says the kingdom is as a mustard seed, which is what he said about faith as well. So think about how many more avenues of study and exploration open up for this comparison when these other meanings are taken into consideration. Anyway, I know this may not be a fully developed thought, and it's not even fully developed in my own mind. But I did think it was worth noting because if we simply read the passage the way Alan did and only think about this mustard seed comparison in terms of size, we may be leaving out a whole other side of this discussion. Now the third possibility is the one that I believe makes the most sense and that is the idea that Jesus allows believers to perform supernatural miracles when and only when divine authority is transferred to them. This option basically says that, you know what? God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So please do not misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not saying that miracles cannot happen because if I were to say that, I would be basically saying that God cannot bring these things to pass. If God has used people in the past to perform miracles, then he has the power and the ability to choose to do that today, right? So he can do that, but I believe first and foremost, that supernatural miracle must first be within the will of God. It has to be the will of God for this thing to happen. And then number two, authority must be then transferred from God to the individual believer, and God must say, you know what, I'm giving you authority to be able to perform this supernatural miracle. As mentioned in the last video, we already established from John 14, 12, Mark 9, 23, and Mark 16, 17 through 18, that the only condition mentioned for doing the miraculous was faith. There is no list of disclaimers regarding the need for divine authority to be transferred or miracles to fit inside God's will. Now, don't get me wrong, I do believe authority plays into this, and we'll unpack that a little more toward the end of the video. But there's no scripture I'm aware of that says some believers have it and others do not. So if that's what Alan is implying here, then that would be an assumption on his part. And then number three, that believer must access that authority and operate in that authority by faith, which is something that the disciples, as we're going to see in just a moment, were not doing. And that's the reason why they weren't able to do certain things that Jesus had already transferred the authority to them to be able to do. Real quick, I want to harken back to something Mr. Parr said earlier is that you're also setting up a situation where if the supernatural event does not occur, then man is left to feel guilty because, hey, you know what? The only reason why my friend didn't get healed, the only reason why this miracle didn't happen, the only reason why this particular person died was because I, the person who was able to pray over them or to perform this miracle, did not have enough faith to believe God to bring it to pass, which then creates another huge problem. So in this instance, if it's a problem because someone may feel guilty if the miracle doesn't occur, wouldn't that be the same problem with the view that he espouses here? And then number three, that believer must access that authority and operate in that authority by faith, which is something that the disciples, as we're going to see in just a moment, were not doing, and that's the reason why they weren't able to do certain things. 
maybe I'm missing something, and you guys are free to let me know what that might be, but it would seem his position puts him in the same boat with the prior scenario that he had mentioned and described as a problem. So let me get back to the scripture in Matthew chapter 17 and give you several considerations as we look at this scripture. Number one is the idea that Jesus often used hyperbolic language whenever he was trying to really push home a point. And the Bible does this all throughout the Bible, right? The Bible says that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro. We know that God doesn't really have eyes because God is spirit. Jesus also referred to himself as a shepherd. He wasn't really a shepherd tending sheep. He also referred to himself as a door, right? I am the door. He's not really a door, right? So uh, we know that Jesus used this hyperbolic language to actually push or drive a point home. He also said that, you know what, if you're going to come after me, you must hate your mother and father. He know, we know that he's not really referring to actual animosity, right? He's using strong hyperbolic language to drive a point home. So I don't believe that Jesus here was referring to an actual physical mountain and saying, you know what, if you have enough faith, you could literally pick this mountain up and cast it into the sea. I believe the idea of a mountain is similar to what it is to us today, which is a insurmountable obstacle in our lives that we need to get over, right? One of the most popular and famous gospel songs of all time was written by Kurt Carr, For Every Mountain You Brought Me Through. We're not talking about God's taking us over physical mountains. We're talking about God bringing us through some very difficult situations in our lives. I don't see too much use in moving actual mountains. So addressing this aspect of Alan's video may not yield a whole lot in the realm of practicality, but I've noticed a tendency in the body of Christ to dumb down the word of God and or add all kinds of disclaimers to it. Alan's words here being an example of what I mean. So let's unpack it a little. First, reading a little later on in Matthew, we find Jesus making nearly the identical statement he made in chapter 17, but this time notice the context in which he makes it. Now in the morning, as he returned to the city, he was hungry, and seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves, and said to it, Let no fruit grow on you ever again. Immediately the tree withered away, and when the disciples saw it, so this is a real event that was witnessed by the disciples, not figurative, they marveled, saying, How did the fig tree wither away so soon? So Jesus answered and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, it will be done. And whatever things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. So while I think we can all agree with Alan that Jesus often did use a hyperbole and figurative language, in this particular context, there isn't anything figurative going on. He literally cursed a literal tree, and it literally withered away. So why would moving a real mountain be out of the question? Now, maybe my pointing out the context doesn't make a difference for you. You've decided that Jesus went from talking about a physical tree being materially altered to immediately talking about a figurative mountain. Okay, that's fine. But at the objective believer, we're always going to bring it back to what can actually be observed in the text. And in none of the accounts where Jesus makes these statements does he add such restrictions regarding moving a mountain. Anyone is free to go above and beyond what the passages say, but obviously that doesn't mean we have to go along with you. Now someone might argue, yeah, but Jesus also didn't say he was talking about a literal mountain. So you're assuming just as much by believing that it's literal as someone who believes it's figurative or hyperbole. But this is another example of how the way you word something will determine whether or not it can be substantiated. See, I wouldn't say Jesus was referring to a literal mountain. I think that's redundant. I would just say what the text says. Mountain. So what is a mountain? A mountain is defined as a large natural elevation of the Earth's surface rising abruptly from the surrounding level, a large steep hill. You can even Google pictures of mountains to see what they look like. One of these is what Jesus said we could speak to and they would move. Another way we could demonstrate that what Jesus says here is not limited to hyperbole or pictorial language is by looking again at Matthew 17, 20 and noticing the last sentence, nothing would be impossible. Nothing. No single thing would be impossible if you believe and speak. Now again, the folks are free to asterisk this statement and say nothing except for moving real mountains is impossible, but Jesus didn't say that, so it would be another assumption. 
As I've said many times before, making assumptions isn't necessarily bad, and all of us do. But obviously, they're not authoritative. It's just your opinion, and while you're free to hold to it, others are just as free not to. Now, consideration number two is that nowhere at all in the Bible, anywhere, do we have any examples of any sort of mountains being displaced or any mulberry trees being uprooted. So once again, I do not believe that this is what uh, Jesus is referring to in terms of a literal mountain. I've seen Alan use this reasoning before in a video we did on the topic of speaking in tongues, and I'm still not really sure what his point is. If he is concluding that since the Bible doesn't record mountains being moved, which, by the way, I'm not entirely sure is true, this therefore means it can't or won't happen, uh, says who? Do the scriptures ever mention such a rule? Does the Bible ever claim that the accounts contained within it are the only events that could ever happen throughout the rest of time? There are all kinds of things happening today that are not mentioned in the Bible. Using videos to teach theology, for example cars, airplanes. So if that's the argument Alan is trying to make with this statement, once again, I don't know how we could go about verifying such an idea. By the way, why are we drawing the line at moving mountains? I mean, you had Moses split the Red Sea, Elijah split the Jordan, Jesus curse and wither a fig tree, the floating axe head, fire falling from the sky, walking on water, are mountains falling into the sea in some kind of separate category that is immune to the supernatural? If so, why? Who's making up these rules? And then the third thing that I'm going to say before we jump into this context is that it is very clear in the scriptures that Jesus transferred certain levels of authority to his disciples that we cannot just assume have been passed down to us and say, well, you know what, if Jesus passed this authority down to his 12 disciples, then therefore we also have this access as well. There is certain authority that Jesus gave to the apostles to the first century apostles that don't necessarily just transfer down to every single believer throughout all history. And we know this to be true because if you just look around in the world, you'll see that there is easily way less miracles happening now than there were during the first century, which is a proven sign that all Christians must not have the same authority that was going on in the early church. Once again, I don't know how he's arriving at this conclusion unless he is rejecting a significant portion of testimonies from all over the world. If you just take the reported healings in, say, Benny Hinn's crusades over the past 30 years, these alone may eclipse New Testament accounts of healings. And that's just from one ministry. As mentioned before, Alan is free to reject these reports, but he doesn't provide a basis for why. We reached out to him and asked and haven't received a response, so we're not going to be able to test his claim. Look at Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. It says here, Jesus called his 12 disciples together and gave them, and gave them, and gave them authority to cast out evil spirits and to heal every kind of disease and illness. Okay, so he says we can't just assume that the authority Jesus gave to his disciples has been passed down to us. Actually, we can. We can assume anything. It just wouldn't be a falsifiable claim. There's no way to test it because there is no scripture that says it is or isn't true which would put it in the same category as so many other claims we often come across in these analysis videos. Like when Alan said that a miracle must be within the will of God. Or when he said authority must transfer from God to the believer before a miracle could be done. Or when he said there was way less miracles happening today than in the first century. So sure, people are free to make that assumption just like Alan is free to make his. But now I'm going to introduce a fact that I think will render this discussion moot. Let's go over to Ephesians chapter 1 where Paul is praying for the church at Ephesus that they would know what is the boundless greatness of his power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet. 
I'm sure you'd agree this right here is the ultimate position of authority, right? The right hand of God far above everything, and notice that last part. All things have been placed in subjection under his feet. The Greek tells us that this word subjection is a military term. It means to be under the command of another. Well, okay, you might say, but this is talking about Jesus. What in the world does it have to do with believers having authority? Well, let's read that last part. And made him head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So Paul says the church is Christ's body. And where did we just read that all things were put under subjection to? His feet. Notice it doesn't say all things were put under subjection to the head, who we know is Christ, but his feet, which is part of his body, the church. That's you and me. Paul further confirms our seating with Christ in the next chapter, where he states plainly that God raised us up with Christ and made us sit with him in heavenly places. You don't even have a choice in the matter. He made you sit down with Jesus. So you see, we can squabble about whether or not Christians have the same authority that Jesus gave to the disciples back there in the Gospels, but to me, that's kid stuff compared to what we find out here in Ephesians. There are other ways to demonstrate this same idea. For example, we could do a word study on what name means and find that it's also part of Christ's authority. He has the name that is above every name. Well, how did he get it? Hebrews 1.4 says he obtained it by inheritance. And then notice Romans 8.17. If we are children, then we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, which means we share that inheritance with him. Finally, even if the Bible didn't say any of this, we could always just fall back to the previously used passages of John 14, 12 that say the person who believes in him will perform the miraculous deeds that Jesus did. Or Mark 16, 17 through 18, that mentions the miraculous signs that would follow believers. And chase that with Mark 9, 23. All things are possible to the one who believes. No mention in any of these passages of authority or the apostles' authority being a prerequisite to the supernatural. We are going to end the video here because I don't feel the remainder really has any new information that I haven't already addressed. But please check out the original publication by Alan Parr. And as always, I welcome any feedback or criticism. Till next time, see ya.